Hello and welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. Happy to be with you and happy to have you with us. I am very happy and proud to uh, introduce our returning guest today. This will be his third appearance, part three of this great presentation that um, Dr. Gamaliel Baer, um, who has an EDD in, uh, in education and his dissertation was about overall health, wellness, organizational balance of the fire service. He is, I'm not going to read you the entire bio because he has an extensive bio, but he is a uh, career firefighter with uh, Howard County, Maryland Fire, and he is also an officer with the Coast Guard. And uh, he has shared with us both parts of his dissertation and parts of a contribution that he's making to a book with the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation that really cover these topics. And if you missed episodes one or two, you can find them on our website. Just go to www.the5-alarmtaskforcecorp.org and just hit the podcast button on the top menu. That'll take you to our library and you can just look for Gamliel Bear EDD in our episodes. And I can tell you that one previous episode was episode 515, uh, 514. And there was one other one was episode, I'm gonna look that up for you quickly here, folks, if I can find it, which I can't right away, but uh, probably around uh, 12 or 13 uh, in the fifth season. That's what the number five is for. So today, Dr. Bear is with us again to, uh, or as his friends call him, G, um, is here to talk about behavioral change as a re as it regards leadership and then organizational change. So G, if you will, let's get going. We're going to start with a quick review of what we've covered so far. Sure. And, um, and thanks for having me back on, Steve. It's always nice and a pleasure to be on your show. This is great. Thank you. So um, just to circle back real quick from the, from the previous two podcasts we did, we built up from sort of what the health and wellness was in the fire service. Uh, to what leadership was. And, and there's a connection, in, in my opinion, with those things, especially since we're talking about human beings. And so, you know, we had started off by saying health and wellness are two different things, even though sometimes those, those words get uh, mixed up. We said health was where you're at and the wellness is how you got there. And then we sort of merged to what resilience was. And we said resilience is really a question of how much your body, mind, and soul can overcome, how much of a challenge. And then we moved from there to the definition of leadership, where we said uh, leadership is, um, as opposed to management, leadership is dealing with humans. It's not dealing with things or processes. Um, and we said leadership involves change. So you're talking about changing humans in some way, and with humans, we have a body, mind, soul. Um, so you're talking about changing one, at least one of those dimensions of a human. We also said that leadership involves that change to be positive. We don't, we don't really think of leaders as somebody who's doing negative things. Uh, there might be somebody who's in charge, but we don't think that that's leadership. So leadership would be a positive change to a human's body, mind, or soul. And it would be doing that by reducing some knowledge gap. Because really, if, if you're not reducing a knowledge gap in the person that you think is following you, then that means they already know what you're trying to tell them. So that would be a requirement of leadership. But all those things can be done by managers as well, especially if it's forced upon somebody. And so where leadership really breaks apart from management is that those things, those changes, those positive changes in humans, uh, by, by giving them some new knowledge, has to be voluntary. And it also has to last when the leader is no longer there. That really shows that somebody adopted that guidance mm -hmm. and is now doing it in the absence of the leader. And that is truly how you know somebody is following you, in, in my opinion. So that's sort of where we got up to in the last two podcasts. And now what we wanna do is sort of um, segue into, well, how do you change somebody's behavior? And in order to do that, we have to first talk a little bit about Aristotle, which is uh, one of my uh, favorite philosophers. And Aristotle gives us this assessment um, in order to find out whether somebody is responsible for their actions. 
So what Aristotle says is you have to look at four different things. He says uh, you have to know if um, somebody was aware or had knowledge of the circumstances surrounding their behavior. Uh, you have to know or assess whether that person knew right from wrong, so whether they knew how to navigate the situation. Uh, you also have to assess what the intention was of somebody's action. And lastly, you have to assess whether there was any force being applied to the person um, on their action. And so those four things are something we're going to quickly go into and, and give some examples about because it's not until you do an assessment of those four things that you can really say, what is it that we have to work on or, or change in order to get somebody's behavior to change? Uh, are we good so far? Absolutely. So uh, we'll go through some examples here just to give the listeners uh, something, uh, you know, fire related to, to make this make sense. So first of all, Aristotle says, if you want to know whether somebody is responsible, ask yourself or ask them or do an assessment of whether they understood the circumstances. So an example would be you get a new recruit into your fire station and uh, this recruit is fresh off the streets. Sometimes that happens, right? Had no fire experience. And um, we all know that some officers are different. I know a lot of my officers like to keep the radio on um, and just listen to what's going on in, in the whole county, in the district, if you will. Well, uh, let's just say, for instance, you had this new recruit come in and the new recruit wasn't really aware of what the tones were, let's just say. Um, and the tones are dropping all day long and the recruit is not really sure what's going on. He was just told to go mop the floors in the bathroom, for instance. Um, and the tones drop for your station and uh, the recruit is nowhere to be found uh, at the engine. And sometimes that happens and the officer just says, all right, you know, tells the driver, let's go ahead and get it. We'll, we'll deal with this when we get back. So how do we know uh, what was the cause of this person's behavior? We, first, we have to start with, were they aware of the circumstances? Did they know what those sounds were going off? Um, and if, uh, if they didn't know what they were, did they know how to find out what those sounds were, right? That would be sort of understanding the knowledge of the circumstances. Uh, just to um, interrupt for a second, that's exactly what I went through. I came in off the street into a volunteer department. They were very, very welcoming. Um, we had the county radio was on throughout the building, all, you know, throughout our building, all the speakers, and you heard tones drop all the time. Uh, the only, initially when I first got in there, you had to know those tones or hear the radio dispatcher say, um, Guilford, you know, Guilford called or station 17 or station 19 to know that you were being dispatched. Uh, but it, they didn't have any, as we do today, the kind of follow up buzzers in in house that would ring with like your Plectron going on oh, Plectron boy, I'm really aging myself. But the old Plectron radios before we had pagers before there were ever were pages. Um, the old Plectron radios would the tones would drop, but it would activate your radio by a subtone that heard heard, and you'd hear a you'd hear a buzzer going off in your plectron. That's what woke you up at night. Well, in the firehouse at that initially they didn't have that, so the tones would drop. People are running around, and if you if you were in the bathroom mopping up the floors because that's what your assignment was, you might have heard people running. But by the time you did, and so you were watching them go out the door because you're still holding a mop, going where do they go? Because you, right. I didn't know. So that was right. back in those days. That must have been a very common thing for, especially for de, for uh, volunteer departments uh, in the South where I was, um, if they all worked in, in that same way. Yeah, yeah, and so and and that's a uh, that's a great um, true world example. I was just giving a you know a made up example, but that happens all the time, I'm sure. And it sounds like it kind of happened to you before. And so that, that first step, knowing the circumstances, that can apply to you as an individual or it can apply to the situation. And, and really what Aristotle wants us to assess is, did the person know the things that can't be changed? And did they know the things that can be changed in any given situation? Like for ourselves, you know, I'm five foot 11, 170 pounds. 
I can't change my height no matter how much I hit the gym. That's a genetic trait that I have. I can't change my eye color, at least not, you know, without contact lenses or something like that. But, but I can change uh, certain circumstances of my life. I can eat different. I can go exercise more, maybe put on some more muscle, change my weight a little bit because of that. So that's, that's the first assessment is did the person know the circumstances? Did they know what could be changed, what couldn't be changed? Did the recruit know that they could go look and find out if those tones were for their station? Did they understand that? So the next step is, does the person know right from wrong? So assuming they know the circumstances, let's go back to the recruit. The recruit hears the tone drops and uh, realizes there's a call going out, but he doesn't know if it's for the station or not, right? That's possible. Now he wants to check. Well, um, knowing right from wrong as far as Aristotle is concerned is a question about finding the, the virtuous middle ground. So Aristotle says, in any um, choice, there's a deficient choice and an excessive choice. So deficiency in this situation would be if the recruit heard tones go off and thought, well, I'll just stay here and maybe someone will come and, and find me. That would be deficiency. Excessive might be this person is running, sprinting down the halls to the, you know, to the captain's office or the lieutenant's office. Um, and does this on every single call and is acting like a chicken with his head cut off. That's excessive. But the virtuous middle ground might be, you know, going to the, the senior man on the floor or, you know, the, the mentor of this recruit and saying, hey, I don't know the calls yet. Is that call for us? Oh, yes. Grab your stuff or no, get back to mopping. And that would be, you know, a virtuous way to go about um, trying to figure out how to navigate that situation. So Aristotle says, uh, assess whether the person knows deficiency and excess in their task and knows how to find that virtuous sort of middle ground. And, and there's more than one virtuous middle answer. As long as it's not deficient or excessive, you know, the answer can be somewhere, you know, for debate, right? So that's the second part is, does the person know right from wrong? Do they know how to navigate the situation? The third part is doing an assessment on the person's intention. Uh, so did they voluntarily choose to act the way they did? So in this scenario, we already mentioned, okay, the, the recruit doesn't come to the engine. The engine leaves without this person. Um, well, did the person make a conscious decision to not go? Or was there some other reason why the person uh, did not make that decision? So, for instance, we know that you can't really hold a baby, an infant, to account on choosing right from wrong because they don't have the mental capacity, right? So lacking mental capacity could be one reason why somebody uh, did an action, but didn't actually intend to do that action. Uh, same is true if, if you're unconscious, you know, we have people who sleepwalk, or if you somehow become semi-conscious and you, and you twitch or you move, it, it's not that you voluntarily did that action. That was sort of something that you didn't intend to do. And so Aristotle says, you have to make sure that the action was intended uh, and voluntarily uh, chosen, basically. So even if you know right from wrong, you can voluntarily choose to do wrong. That happens all the time, right? right. Oh, yes. So that would, be the, that would be the third assessment, is understanding the intent of the action or the intent of the choice. And the last assessment would be assessing whether or not um, the, the person had any sort of force being applied to them that, that diminished their ability to freely choose something. Um, and so, in other words, was that person acting as a free agent or was there something that uh, was applying force? And so, for instance, a sudden injury could cause a person not to not be able to make an action, even though they know the action they should take, right? Sure. Um, you, you could have a, a family member or an employer putting force through rules or policies on somebody that basically makes you make a choice or else there's consequences. Or even, for example, nature. If, um, you know, if you're on a, a, a boat and there's a huge storm coming and you have to, you know, throw all of the gear over the boat to make it, uh, you know, hopefully withstand the storm, you know, that's another potential choice that was sort of forced onto you. 
And so the last assessment is understanding, was this person sort of forced or given some sort of duress as to why they chose what they chose? And so going back to the example of the recruit, we can say, okay, look, the call's over, the engine comes back, the lieutenant's really upset with the recruit, goes, finds the recruit, and says, you know, why didn't you come to that, to that call? Did you hear the tones come out? And the recruit says, yes, I heard the tones. Well, did you know that those tones were for us? Yes, I knew those were our tones. I've been studying the tones, you know, LT or captain or whatever. And now the captain says, well, so why didn't you come to the engine and go on the call with us? And the recruit says, well, uh, you know, the senior man told me mop these floors and, you know, don't come out until I'm done. And so, or else, right? And so now the, what, what Aristotle would say is that that's the revealing point Now the officer understands, oh, it's not that he didn't know the circumstances. It's not that he didn't know right from wrong. You know, maybe he asked the recruit, do you know what you do when a call comes out? Yes, yes, you go on the engine and get all your stuff, whatever. So he knows how to navigate the situation. But he finds out that, you know, the recruit was threatened, maybe with some physical, you know, punishment or something like that from the mentor. And basically interpreted that if he left the job of mopping for any reason until he was done, he would get in trouble. And so he, so he kept mopping. Right. And, um, and the Lieutenant would have to take that up with the mentor or the senior man and say, look, because of what you said, or the way you said it, this person didn't come on the call. And, um, and you were basically applying some sort of force psychologically or physically to this person that caused them to not make the right action that they, that they thought they should make. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It, it, it really does. And because we know that, um, you know, we, the fire service has a history that sometimes we treat our probies or our rookies with a little bit of disdain to toughen them up as the old, right. the old saying would be. Um, but that doesn't mean, I think, like you've just pointed out that, uh, and usually uh, the rookie will put their tr- faith and trust in whoever was assigned as their mentor or as their senior man or their officer. And, you know, what they say goes basically, unless the chief steps in to say something else. So it, we know that that occurs. Um, very rarely is it ever done with uh, personal enmity for, especially if it's really a, a real rare, re- you know, really new recruit or something like that. But the misunderstanding is certainly possible under those circumstances. And I don't think that's something that we've ever really considered or, or thought of. But, you know, I think bringing uh, the, the thinking of Aristotle and his philosophy from several thousand years ago to today, to today's fire service, initially when you said you wanted to talk about Aristotle, I was going to think, okay, I'm trying to think, was he, was he like a volunteer firefighter in Greece or something like that? But no, what, but what you just said really makes so much sense because of the nature of our past and even some of our current history. Uh, right. I, I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and um, th- there are other ways that we could finish that example. So for instance, maybe, maybe there was no threat by a senior man, but maybe his knee popped right when he was going for the call, right? Um, and he knew he had to get to the engine, but physically couldn't because his knee popped on trying to leave from not mopping. That would be another example of he was under some, some force was being applied to this person, in this case, physical bodily force from his knee right. that prevented him from getting to the engine. Or he maybe fell unconscious because he had a seizure or something like that. You know, there are other reasons why you could end that story with other ways. Maybe, maybe the ceiling collapsed in the bathroom. You know, we don't know. We'd have to assess that. That's what Aristotle would say. And so that, that example is, um, that would be a really easy fix. The way we ended the example, the lieutenant would just talk to the mentor or the senior man and say, hey, uh, no more of that. You know, you can, you can tell him to do something, but, you know, the way you said it prevented him from going on this call. So that, that fix is easy. But when we talk about behavior change, we're talking about, you know, a better example might be like weight for a firefighter. You got a new recruit, you know, the firefighter is overweight and, you feel like they're a hazard to the team. So you want them to lose a little bit of weight uh, before they start going on some, you know, engine calls or truck calls or whatever. Now, what are we going to do to address the behavior change? So this brings us into the first step, which is, um, you know, assessing 
what Aristotle would say, you have to assess these four things. And usually in, in behavior change, you know, it could be somebody telling them not to lose weight. It could be some force, like, you know, maybe if you, if you live in a, uh, you know, a poorer area and there's not a, there's not a place where you can go get fresh food within a five mile radius, you know, and you're stuck just getting junk food, you know, those are things that are sort of out of your control. And that's not really about behavior change as much as it's about trying to change the environment or the situation. Right. But assuming that's not the case, then we would start by assessing what does this person know about the circumstances? What does this person know as far as right from wrong? Um, and are they choosing right if they know right? And so once we make that assessment, we would then move to um, the next step, which is now we have to address that issue. And to address the behavior change, uh, first we have to come up with some sort of goal. Um, so the lieutenant might make a goal and say, look, we need to get you down 10, to 10 pounds or whatever. That's the goal. Let's, let's uh, agree to something. And if, if we're talking about doing this in, the, in leadership versus management, you know, obviously we would assume that everything is voluntary. So we're just assuming here that, that the recruit is going along voluntarily with all of this sort of coaching, if you will, or this leadership, if you will. So they both come together, they agree to a goal of weight loss, let's call it 10 pounds. Um, once you've established that goal, and, uh, and by the way, for the, for the listeners who've never heard of it, it's probably worth looking into what um, a SMART goal is. It's an acronym, stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. And so when you do a goal that's under the SMART goal model, uh, the chances of reaching that goal are, are much more likely. And the idea of SMART goals is to make it so that, um, you know, a 10-year-old might want to be a doctor, right? But there's a lot of smaller steps to becoming a doctor if you're 10, right? And so using the SMART goal model, you would break down all those steps into the next chunk, the next step, uh, until you reach your final goal. So, um, so in addressing behavior change, first, you have to come up with a goal. And hopefully it's attainable and bound by some sort of time restrictions and relevant to that person. Uh, you would then, the next thing here is uh, you have to find out, well, what's their baseline? Uh, where are they at right now? You know, the, the lieutenant might know they need to lose some weight, but we don't really know what that person's weight is. And the reality is, uh, as individuals, as humans, we don't walk around all day taking baselines of ourselves all the time. Uh, I think it's more natural to be walking down the street or sitting in your house and being like, hey, you know what? I want to make this new goal for myself. Um, that comes first. And then you say, well, where am I at right now? And now we have to understand what that gap is. Um, I don't know too many people who any minute of the day, you know, just keep a, a long running list of baselines about themselves uh, of things that might potentially change one day when they come up with a goal. It's usually the other way. First, the goal appears, then you check what your baseline is. And then when you have those two things, you have a gap or maybe you don't have a gap. Maybe you thought you needed to lose weight and your goal was to be, you know, 170, like that's what I weigh right now. And then I go and weigh myself and I realize I'm 170. I say, huh, that's interesting. I thought I had to lose weight, but. I'm right where I thought I needed to be, right? So assuming there's that gap, um, that tells you, okay, uh, we have something to shoot for. And then the last thing you need to do in addressing behavior change is identifying based on Aristotle's framework, what is it, uh, what new behavior is needed to change um, that reality? So um, is it the eating? Is it the exercise? Um, in, in other examples, maybe it's, hey, this person doesn't know how to pull a hose line. We need to get them to study or practice pulling hose line. That's the behavior that we need to do. So that uh, quick overview would be, you know, and, and that shouldn't be news to anybody. Anybody who's been in an a, a officer position probably understands that those are the three main areas you have to sort of um, figure out in order to get somebody to do something. So that would be the addressing. But here's where I think uh, it might be interesting to some people to debate or discuss is the implementation of that change. So now you've figured out the goal, you've figured out the gap by looking at the baseline, you've figured out what needs to change in order to close that gap, how do you implement it? And um, I think the issue here is that in order to implement some sort of behavior change, we talked about the definition of leadership, the person has to learn something, right? right? 
Um, otherwise, if they already know how to do what it is they need to do, uh, then the question is, why aren't they doing it? And it could be, like we said earlier, there could be just something stopping them from doing it and no learning is really needed here. Maybe you just need to, um, you know, remove some barrier from this person's life. Now, when you talk about teaching somebody something new, there's really three ways we can do that. One is um, through trial and error. One is through um, showing that person the right way to do something and having them try to copy you. And then one is um, just teaching them. So like pure education, whether it's reading a book or discussing something with that person. And the, the leader here in this situation would have to decide what is the best way. Maybe it's a combination of the three, maybe it's one of those three, um, but there are multiple ways to get information across to somebody. Does that make sense? Right, yeah, and I, I wanna bring something else up to, from what you just mentioned, which I think is very important. We can arc based on this little uh, example that we used about a new recruit needs to lose weight. Um, that we can arc back to our first podcast together. And one of the things we talked about in talking about firefighter health and wellness is that we talked about there is, especially today, um, there is a difference between what the career department can do when they put a new cadet in an academy and what our volunteer and combination departments can do with new recruits. Um, right. I think we, we know uh, it, it's, not, I'm not saying anything out of, out of telling tales out of school, but we, we know that there is, first of all, obesity problem in this, in this country, throughout this country. Um, and we know we have a certain obesity problem in the fire service, both career and volunteer and and wildland. Although our wildland seems for the most part to be probably probably in better shape because of the nature of their work. Um, many mm -hmm. of them have to parachute in. And we know that that's, that's very, a very balanced system of weights and measures to be able to, to do that right. parachute. Um, and uh, they use a tremendous amount of calories in their work when they're out on the ground. And while you might say, well, they're not, you know, fighting forest fires every day. No, thank God they're not. But enough of, the, of them do, enough of them, to, enough of those times, and the work that it entails keeps their calorie requirements very, very high so they can function. Right. But when we take in a new recruit in the volunteer department, you know, the officer, the chief officer, the recruitment officer, somebody saying, well, wait, geez, we're down like five people. And this person wants to join. I really want to give them opportunity. But how do I tell them they need to lose weight? And I think that example that you just gave is that we can find a way, if we use that SMART goal acronym, there is a way to encourage that person with explaining what the tasks are going to be inspected of him or her and saying, look, we want you to be able to do this job. You're interested in doing it. We want to, we love that interest. We want to bring you in. But to do so, we also have to, there's a lot we have to train you on. And some of it is very, can be exerting on the system. And we want you to be healthy to do this. We want to help you. And that way you, and you don't just tell them, go home and come back after you lose 10 pounds. And then you can, we'll think about taking you into our organization. Rather, you bring them in and you encourage them to say, hey, you know, we'd love to work with you and we'd love to have you work with us, but we're gonna have to work on a couple of different levels. We're gonna train you to be a firefighter with us, but we also have to train you how to be a healthy firefighter and do your best. Right. It. And I think that the SMART goal, if you have good, good officers, good mentors who understand that concept, I think we can, we can, I don't like you, but sweeten the pot. It maybe it might not be the right term, but sweeten the pot to keep their interest and keep them involved, keep them as members, meaning that once we have members, they're our best recruiters in the first place, especially when we have a dearth of, of volunteers right now, and keep them interested and let them know that somebody cares about them. Here's a brand new organization right. that you walked into and you have people who are coming out to help, help you. They wanna help you and help care for you to make you a better person, a better firefighter. And I think that will carry that message in a much more positive vein than saying, 
yeah, you know, you're good, but mm, you know, you need to lose 15, 20 pounds. So, you know, come back right. and done that because they're going to walk away and they'll never come back. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great point, Steve. And I think that really gets to the heart of um, this new push to have these support systems in place. And we'll, we'll sort of circle back to that, I think, in the next uh, part of this podcast when we talk about organizational leadership and, and the systems that are required in, in an organization. But I think you're absolutely right, which is, um, you know, if people feel like they're being supported and offered something. Um, I think there's, there's more of a desire to take, take those uh, offerings and those suggestions seriously or, or even just give them a try. Uh, whereas if they're not being offered, uh, you know, sort of you don't see it, you don't hear it, and uh, you're just left to your own, uh, you know, volition to try to decide what you think you may need to do in your life. Um, you know, I think that leaves a little bit more up to chance as far as, um, you know, if, if, people, if people know better, uh, you know, I can't say they always do better, but you give them the opportunity to do better if they know better. If they don't know any, you don't know what you don't know, and you're not going to change if, if you don't think you need to or, or you have no knowledge of it. Exactly. Um, which I, and that brings us, I think, uh, into a good segue into this implementing the behavior change, um, which is, you know, a leader has to be, um, you know, they have to be smart. They have to be clever on how they implement the change to the individual. Um, you know, trial and error can be very dangerous. We, we don't necessarily want to tell somebody, hey, just go in that gym and, and just, uh, you know, put some weight on the squat rack and just give it a try. Um, but you can plan safely to give somebody trial and error. Um, and I think we see this a lot of times in the, in the firehouse. Um, you know, somebody, maybe there's like a friendly bet between somebody, oh, you can't pull that dummy or you can, all right, you know, let's give it a try, whatever. That's, that's sort of a form of trial and error. And then if it's done in a safe environment, uh, that's a very good learning experience. And I think it, trial and error, if done safely, can be one of the best learning experiences because uh, it's, you know, you're, something is happening to you that you're experiencing, especially if it's a failure, at least at first, and you learn, okay, that's not what to do, and here's what I should do. Uh, trial and error can be a very great learning tool, but it's not always available as a learning tool. Um, sometimes we don't have the, either the time or the ability to just do trial and error, especially if it means potentially breaking something. Um, so, you know, we have to go maybe to just, I'm going to cut to the chase and show you how to do something the right way, right? So you repeat after me, you're follow me. Um, and again, that has to be crafted by somebody. Um, like you said, you can't just tell somebody what to do. You know, you want to be able to show them the right way and get them to follow you and hopefully not break anything, right? Um, but you can also show somebody the right way of doing something without a hands-on sort of project. It could be, uh, you know, the way you treat somebody else, the way you connect to a patient, you know, the bedside manner, if you will. Um, that's also a way of showing somebody how to do something. And you wouldn't necessarily want to do trial and error with bedside manner necessarily, right? So uh, this is where thinking through how you're going to implement this behavior change in somebody um, you know, takes a little bit of effort by the, by the leader. Um, and of course, like I said, that, that if you're just observing somebody doing something the right way, it may be less deep of a knowledge uh, experience than trial and error, but it's still, um, it's still a very good way to learn. Um, then there's just the pure education or knowledge transfer. That might be, that might risk being the shallowest way to learn uh, because you know, somebody's not seeing somebody else do something or they're not trying for themselves. Maybe they eventually do try for themselves based on what they learned uh, or read. But, um, but it risks being the shallowest, especially if you just read something or hear something once, you know, a lot of times you're going to forget that. You know, exactly. But on the other hand, um, and, and, and truth be told, probably the listeners will forget most of what we talk about on this podcast unless they listen to it more than once or take notes. But uh, the, the good thing about pure knowledge is that it has the farthest reaching ability. You can, you can read a book that somebody wrote 2000 years ago. I can study Aristotle. I never lived with him. You know, he, he wrote his works 2,500 years ago on a different side of the planet than I am, right? So when you do knowledge exchange, it has the farthest reaching ability. Um, you can talk to somebody on the phone. We're talking, you know, across multiple state lines over the internet right now. 
So that's the third way that you can potentially implement behavior change. And, and the leader has to decide which of those or which combination of those are they going to use to get this person to reduce the gap, whether it's a knowledge of circumstances, knowledge of right and wrong, um, choosing right from wrong, if they know right from wrong, um, and, and how they're going to go about planning with that, with that individual, which things need to change in order to close those gaps. Uh, and the last part about implementing behavior change, it's not really a major issue, but it is a, it is a way for the leader to kind of know whether they're doing the right thing or not, is documenting. So you want to be able to document what's happened along the way. And that way you can correct, do a course correction or, you know, you can use this as either proof for somebody to get to somebody else and say, hey, this really works. Or it can be refuted um, by somebody and say, hey, let me see your, your documentation. Let me see your data and, and see what it is that you think you did. Because truly uh, doing these behavioral change, um, you know, uh, activities, Really, it, you could call it an experiment in a sense. You can call it science. It's, it's human-based science. As long as you're not forcing somebody, it doesn't have to be management. It can be leadership by, by being voluntary, but it's still you know, human-based behavioral sciences nonetheless. Um, and so documentation is important because you can sort of do course corrections or, right. or go back and see what you did wrong if you need to. Um, and that brings us to the next question. It, it is sort of a, a question that gets um, prompted by this is, well, not everybody is ready to change at the same rate. And, uh, and there's a theory about that. It's called the trans-theoretical model of behavioral change, or the TTM. And uh, what that model says is that, look, if people are at different stages in their life at different times, um, and you're not always going to be able to get somebody to engage in a behavior change activity just because you as the leader are ready. So they say there's a, a few stages in the TTM. Actually, I think it's five. There's pre-contemplation. Somebody is in a stage where they're not even thinking about changing yet. There's contemplation. So they're now thinking about change, but they're not ready to act. There's action where they're now working towards the behavior change. Uh, there's maintenance where they're working to keep the behavior change. And then there's termination, which is you no longer need the leader support. Uh, to make that change, you're sort of good to go on your own. And of course, one other op, op, uh, possibility is uh, you you revert back to either action or maintenance. You know, sort of like if you regress a little bit until until you're ready to do that all on your own. For some people, maybe they'll never be able to do something all on their own, and for others, maybe they'll reach that point quicker. But it is important to understand that um, based on the TTM, you know, you can have uh, ten people on the same shift. And only one of them is really ready to receive guidance voluntarily from a leader <laughs> and potentially the rest of them need to be managed. That's possible. And that's, that is one of those uh, interesting parts about leadership is that, you know, uh, leadership isn't always going to work because it takes, it's a two-way street. It takes a leader and a follower to engage voluntarily. And if the follower is not ready to voluntarily engage, you can't be a leader because you don't have a follower to get, engage with you. Does that make sense? It does. It does. You know, you brought up something there that reminded me of a very cute story was teaching somebody else. And that was when I joined the fire department in North Carolina, I was one of the other, my buddy and I, we were the first two Jewish people ever to go into this department. And um, I was more observant then and I was uh, keeping kosher outside the home. But I would usually go for my lunch hours down to the firehouse. Um, which was good because it also got me some daytime calls uh, to run during that time. But uh, I would never eat with what they were making for lunch because I told them I kept kosher. And I, they asked, a couple of them wanted to know a little bit more about kashrut, and I explained it to them. So I come in one day, this is after a couple of months, and one of the, 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 uh, the uh, caretakers, the guys who worked 24 on, 48 off to get the first piece out, he, he said, I brought my bag to lunch of lunch with me. He says, Steve, I got something that you can eat with us today. I said, what? He goes, a can of beans. I said, I know you can't eat the hot dogs, but I can, beans. He says, it has that symbol on the can that you told me about. So I had told them, taught them about the UO and, or the Circle K or something like that. So I said, man, that is the nicest thing you could have done. Thank you so much. I said, I said let me see it. So he brings it out and I'm looking on the can. And I, all I, I said, Bruce, is this the symbol you were talking to? Talking about, he says, yeah, I said, that's a circle R. That means a registered trademark. 
but thank you. It wasn't, it wasn't the OU. I said, but thank you for looking specifically so that you could include me in the lunch. I said, even though I can't, I can't eat that, that the effort means more to me than even having the meal with you because you went out of your way to try to do something to be, help me be inclusive. And I think that's exactly what you just touched on. There is a way of reaching out and, and teaching someone that you don't know necessarily if they pick it up or not until they make an effort to give back to you some of the information that they've picked up from you. And yes, they, it might not be exact, but at least they, they picked up something from when you first taught them and they're trying to implement it. And I think that's that communication that, we, that you're talking about. Yeah, and actually that's a, a great point. If you go back to what Aristotle would say, he would say that um, the person uh, thought they knew how to navigate the situation and made the right intention for the right choice, right? Exactly. They just didn't really know the circumstances well enough. Right. So for, from a leader standpoint, you have to go back and re-educate them about the circumstances. Um, and, and then they knew, they thought they knew how to navigate it, right? They did, if that was truly the, the kosher bean uh, can, they would have done the right choice. Absolutely. You know, it, it was only wrong because they just needed to be re-educated about the circumstances, exactly. essentially. Exactly. And so uh, it's a great example. Um, and uh, and in that person's case, you know, yeah, they were technically wrong. They had the right heart. They had the right intention. Uh, but it just needed a little bit of re-education. And, uh, and then that behavior will change next time. I'm sure if they had another and out of their opportunity, they would have brought you the, the right can of beans or you oh, know, whatever did. food later it was on, that they would have tried. Yep, later on, they did. Yeah. They did. It was. Oh, nice. Okay, we were, great. We were very lucky that here we are, the first two Jewish guys in this department. And there was, in the four years that I was there and three and a half years that my buddy was there, uh, there was never once anything that, wasn't inclusive for us. They, we were never set aside. Um, we were invited to the Christmas parties. They wanted to know if we wanted a Hanukkah party to do. Uh, and it was just, they were just a great group of, of people to be with, uh, accepting and eager to learn. And um, because they really, most of them did not know any Jewish people because they were in the right. team were just over the city line. And so there was a big difference. And uh, that was what I was working in town for as an educator. So um, to me, it was just another piece of what I was doing at the synagogue, just doing it at the firehouse by people who were saying, I do want to learn about you and your practice and your faith. That's great. It really was. Steve, uh, oh, I think um, what we can do here is we can do uh, one more uh, small section and then maybe take a break okay. for, our, uh, for our guests. Um, and this section really uh, is uh, the second part of the TTM issue, which is not everybody's ready, right? Um, how do you get somebody to uh, want to do the right thing? So in the TTM, um, you know, like we said, you could be in pre-contemplation or in contemplation. You either aren't even thinking about the change or maybe you're thinking about the change and you're not yet sure if you want to make action on the change. And in those circumstances, um, knowledge would be a really good thing to give to this person, you know, giving them some education about the circumstances, um, or maybe they're not ready to make action because they don't know how to take action. So explaining to them how to navigate. Um, but if somebody's ready to take action and they're trying to work on maintenance, you know, that might be more of a motivation issue. And, uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about motivation and um, I'll briefly touch upon uh, sort of, you know, the carrot and the stick idea, which is used in management. Um, and then we'll talk about ways that aren't carrot and stick related. Um, and we're going to talk about Daniel Pink. He's got a famous sort of model of, uh, of motivation uh, that your listeners can look up on their own time, but we'll go over quickly. So, um, so the interesting thing about motivation is, um, like we said, you can use the carrot and the stick, which is, hey, if you do this, you will get this, or if you don't do this, this will happen to you. Um, but that, that's a management tool. We don't want to encourage somebody who thinks they're going to be a leader or is trying to be a leader to do that. You're basically using influence um, or force to try to get somebody to do what you want them to do. And on top of that, um, I would argue that 
introducing that type of motivation, a carrot and stick, even though we label it as motivation because the idea is you're trying to get somebody to do something, it actually requires knowledge. You won't be uh, motivated, even extrinsically, even from the carrot and stick, unless you know what the reward or punishment is, right? So you have to give somebody knowledge for them to be motivated of those carrot and stick rewards, whatever. But again, that's management science. We're not trying to show people how to do management science. Of course, they could do it if they, if they need to. But from a leadership standpoint, how do you motivate somebody uh, without using the carrot and stick? And Daniel Pink has this great model. He says, um, there's three things you can try to uh, increase, which are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So first, he says, autonomy, uh, that's really the idea of being self-governing. You know, the idea that you are sort of ruling yourself and you're not being managed by somebody who's telling you what to do every second of the day. And uh, what, that, what that does to somebody when they feel like they're autonomous or you're giving them autonomy or more autonomy, they feel like they're trusted to take ownership in their actions. Mm-hmm. Or as Aristotle would say, there's no force being applied to you. You're, you're acting with free will, right? There's no duress. Uh, no one telling you to do this or else. Um, and the best way to, um, to increase somebody's autonomy, I think, or, and, and this is also shown in the literature, is um, to increase the person's knowledge of cause and effect. Let them know that what they do um, will, will create a, a positive contribution to the team, if you will. Uh, there's actually a theory called attribution theory, and it's all about trying to get people to understand that you can attribute your actions to some results. And a lot of times, uh, especially somebody newer on the shift, they might not know what they're doing uh, contributes to the shift. Um, And so if you want to increase somebody's autonomy, then sometimes the best thing you can do is just teach them, give them knowledge about how their actions will directly impact the outcome of something. And even though Autonomy, from Daniel Pink's standpoint, is a motivation uh, increaser. It actually relies on knowledge. It relies on teaching somebody that what they do is going to impact some outcome that we want. And so um, uh, that's one way. The, the next way is mastery. Mastery is about feeling like you have the possession of, uh, of some skill or technique. And, um, and what that does for somebody is it, it shows them that they're capable of doing something with excellence. People, people don't want to do an action if they feel like they're going to screw up all the time. Sure. They want to do something and be shown to be good at it. They want to master their craft. So Daniel Pink says mastery is that second way to motivate people. And in order to increase mastery or the sense of mastery, uh, people have to believe that they can constantly improve and that they have a path to improvement. And um, if they're with a, uh, a leader who they feel like can't help them either improve their own skills or master their craft or give them a path to get there, that's going to make them lose their motivation. They're going to feel like, hey, I can't get better under this officer or this officer is not letting me go to trainings. And, and that's really demotivating to people. So there's a theory called the self-efficacy theory. And what that is, is um, it's about having people get better at doing a skill. It's sort of like confidence, but in a very specific sense. So you can have, you can increase your self-efficacy on pulling hose. If you have somebody who shows you how to pull hose real well or throw ladders, you can increase your self-efficacy. And the more somebody feels that they can do an act with excellence, the more they're likely to do that act. So increasing mastery might come down to just giving somebody knowledge on how to execute a specific course of action better, you know, essentially increasing their self-efficacy. And the last one that Daniel Pink talks about is purpose. And that's all about having somebody feel like um, there's some goal or some object to be attained that is, um, that is for the greater good or the greater purpose. People want to feel that. And uh, sometimes people just need help seeing the bigger picture they, they get lost, uh, you know, they get stuck seeing the trees for the, you know, the forest, if you will. And uh, sometimes they just need that 30,000 foot view and a good leader can teach them how something really is uh, purposeful. 
And so uh, there's another theory called utility value theory, which is all about get, changing somebody's perception of the usefulness of what they're doing. You're basically reframing an issue so that they feel like what they're doing is useful or you show them why what you're doing is useful. Give them the big picture. Show them how this helps the greater good and they're more likely to do it. And so to increase somebody's sense of purpose, it could just come down to increasing their knowledge of the value that their actions have uh, to the contribution of the group or society. Um, and so again, Daniel Pink, he talks about these three things, autonomy, mastery, purpose. Autonomy is feeling like what you do is caused by you, like you actually can make an effect happen. Mastery is feeling like you can get better at something. And um, purpose is feeling like what you're doing is for a greater good. And those three things can really improve somebody's motivation, Steve. Oh, no. And so I'll turn it over to you for the break. Um, but Yeah, I mean, that, that just really boils it down. It, it's, really what, it's really what, the especially if we apply this to the fire service, it's what this, the fire service is all about, those three things. You have, we have to teach the new person what to do and how to do it. We have to give them the opportunity to try to do it to the best of their ability. And they may not have mastered it the first time. You know, think about punching out a lock. The first time you, you have to learn to punch out a lock. Very few people would get it on the, on the first try if they're brand new. But you give them a few tries, you send them to a conference, a regional conference or a local conference where they can get other, other instructors as well. And they take that course I want to do, taken out a door and they go through the first lock and they punch it out that time. Hey, I did it. I actually did it. And this guy just showed me a little better way to hold that sledge. And I got more force with it. And I got right through the lock. Isn't that great? And that those three levels that you just talked about, I think really are, are definitely worthwhile for any level of the fire service and really anything in, in public service. Because if you, you, you entice them in, you got to give them something for them to stay, as you said. Um, you just can't put them, you know, you'd be on the nozzle on the first call. And you've never had any training, but you have to teach them. Right. And then you have to make sure that they're getting it and that they can implement it. And when they implement it, they get that feeling of self-satisfaction, that they've done something proper, they've done something correctly that has contributed to the greater good of the organization and the community. That's how you keep people. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Very true. Great. Great way to sum up that first part. All right, folks, we're going to take a brief break here. Uh, if you are watching the video, you will not see anything different. If you're listening to the audio, we'll be right back right after these words. As always, please stay tuned. And welcome back to this podcast with Five Alarm Task Force and my guest, Dr. Gamali Elbert. Uh, a P, an EDD, I have to keep remembering saying EDD, a firefighter with Howard County, Maryland Fire Department and an officer with our United States Coast Guard. And we are wrapping up a, a three-part series with, with uh, Dr. Bear as we talk about the overall health, wellness uh, in, in all aspects, not what we've been concentrating on in our health initiatives as of late, but overall, not just people, but as the organizational uh, health and wellness. And um, we're wrapping that up today. And as a matter of fact, our last topic in uh, the pod, this podcast and for the series is organizational leadership that Dr. Bear has taken us through from the very beginning from individual health and wellness as he redefined in the opening part of today's podcast. But now we're going to talk about come back down to this level of organizational leadership and how that contributes to the overall wellness of this organization. And, and for our purposes, we're talking about basically the three main organizations, public safety, the fire service, law enforcement, and, and, and DMS, and of course, of course including our uh, brothers and sisters in wildland firefighting as well. So Dr. G, if you will, please. Sure. Um, so we're, we're moving on here to organizational leadership, and this is going to be sort of the, uh, the capstone of where we've come over these last three uh, podcasts. And, um, and I, what I want to uh, I just con convey to the listeners and viewers is that um, 
organizational leadership really is leadership, but doing it on a bigger scale. And so anytime something is scaled up, um, it, it shouldn't have to change. Um, something that's a bigger scale is just the same thing, but bigger. And so if we're talking about um, organizational leadership and we can't draw a very clean line to leadership, then we're not talking about the same thing. And so what I, what I want to sort of like really make clear is that whenever we're talking about organizational leadership, it should be the same as the definition for individual leadership, just for the organization. And I say that because going back to, I think, last podcast, when we talked about the definition of leadership, we mentioned that, uh, you know, the word leader or the word leadership can be used as either a noun or a verb. And when you're using it as a noun, it refers to somebody in a place, whether they're in charge, or maybe it refers to the plural of the folks that are in charge of your department. Sometimes we say, oh, that's just the leadership, because we mean the folks in charge. Um, There's no reason we couldn't say that's just the executive suite, or that's just management. In fact, sometimes we do say that's just management. But we use the term leadership interchangeably between nouns and verbs. And when we say leadership training, um, I'm not aware of, although maybe this is the secret meaning of it, but I've always taken leadership training to mean how you act when you are engaging in leadership, not how you should act when you're in charge, because we already have a word for that. That's called management training, right? So to call management training, leadership training would be misleading. And so when we talk about organizational leadership, we shouldn't just be talking about management in disguise. And I say that because we should be following the same principles. We should be talking about something that is, you know, reducing a knowledge gap in others. We should be talking about something that's positive, changing humans, uh, changing their body, mind, or soul, um, but also doing it voluntarily and hopefully having it last um, in the absence of the leader. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called organizational leadership. It would be called organizational management. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. So, so I want to start off with an example. Um, and uh, this is just going to be used to sort of, again, debate the difference between organizational leadership and management. Um, any of the firefighter listeners is, is, is going to be familiar with this. We're just going to talk about sort of your run-of-the-mill box alarm. Um, box alarm goes out and you have a seasoned engine company, they roll up on scene, um, the lieutenant's uh, sitting in the right front seat, um, the driver positions the engine, starts to set up water delivery, the lieutenant begins a 360 of the structure, firefighters pull the right line, they start to make entry, uh, you know, you got a room and contents, lieutenant makes it back around, catches up to the crew, goes in, they make a knock on the fire, fires out, everybody did an excellent job, efficient job. Was that leadership? Did the lieutenant lead? And uh, by my definition, no. Um, The lieutenant was in charge. You you could use the word noun and say, the leader of that group was the lieutenant. But in this particular case, when you have a veteran crew that all knows what to do, the person in charge really doesn't have to say anything. They're just there to take responsibility or accountability for what happened. Um, And there are potentially situations where the lieutenant doesn't have to say one word. Everybody just does what they need to do because they know what to do. It's a routine bread and butter call. Well, what if the crew wasn't a veteran crew? What if they were a a younger, newer crew and the veteran and the lieutenant had to, you know, bark orders at the crew uh, throughout the evolution? They still put out the fire. Everything gets done. But throughout the call, the lieutenant was barking orders and saying, do this, do that, get on the radio, whatever. Is that leading? And I would argue that in either case, that's not leading. Uh, that's managing. That's, uh, that's making sure that the people do what they're supposed to do, whether, whether it's oversight and making sure the veteran crew doesn't make a mistake, or whether it's actively managing or directing somebody to do something. Um, we're assuming that anybody who gets cut loose to ride on the engine knows how to accomplish a task they might just not know when or where to do it. And so in, this, in the case of a younger crew, the lieutenant isn't 
teaching you how to do something that you don't know. They're just telling you what to do and when to do it and in what circumstance to do it. That's not leadership. You're just saying, hey, take that hose and pull it to that door. They already know what to do or they already know how to do it. They're just going to do it because you told them to. So when we, when we look at that, we can use that as an example on a smaller scale to now look at a bigger scale. Let's talk about a whole department. Um, is it, or if, if we agree that the lieutenant or the captain on the scene that we just talked about is not leading, that they're managing or directing, then what do you call somebody who's leading, quote unquote, leading an organization? Is the leader, the person who's in charge of an organization, are they doing leadership just because they're in charge of the organization? And I would, I would say if that was the case, then we should only ever give leadership awards to people who are in charge of an organization or some unit. But that's not how leadership awards are given. Right. Because inherently, somewhere deep inside, we know that leadership isn't just being in charge. And so I would argue that somebody who's in charge of an organization, the fire chief of an organization, isn't an organizational leader in the verb sense. They might be in the noun sense, but you could easily call them an organizational director or manager, and it would mean the same thing from a noun perspective. Right. But from a verb perspective, are they actually making the people in the organization better through changes in their body, mind, or soul? Um, and are they voluntarily adopting those changes? Meaning he's not applying, he or she is not applying rules to keep them to do that or to make those changes. There, and, and a lot of times what we refer to from a, uh, a perspective of a fire chief who actually has done some sort of really great leadership thing we go to that, uh, that second uh, mode of training, which is a lived example. People watch their fire chief act a certain way or do a certain thing, and then they say, hey, I want to be like that person. So they voluntarily start doing what that person's doing. That would be leadership. Uh, it wasn't mandated. It's just the fire chief having a high-profile role, doing something that seems to be a better way of doing it, and then people follow that way, not being forced. But, but just being in that position doesn't make you a an organizational leader in the verb sense. Okay, so let me ask you this. Using your example of that call, lieutenants inside the dwelling with the team making the knock, and the IC shows up. Mm -hmm. and he sees flames coming from another location and tells the second due engine to hook up to the hydrant and feed the first engine and send another crew with another hose line to the Bravo side, okay? And then he's commanding the EMS team that's coming in to, to make their way and stand by. He has a RIT team coming in to stand by. Is that I see now being a leader both in the verb, I mean, both in the noun and the verb? As he's directing? No, no he's, he's just being more, more No, because those are all orders. Right? Yeah, those are orders. You have to follow orders. You're not, right. you're not being asked if you would like to voluntarily do something. You're being told you better do this, and if you don't do it, there's there's punishment for that. Um, if you if you show cowardice on the scene because you were ordered to do something that was not completely obviously unsafe, yeah, you can be punished in the fire service or in the military. Same way, you can be punished for disobeying orders. Those are direct orders. You have to do that. That's that's probably one of the stronger versions of management because if you take it to the logical conclusion, if we say that's leadership then authoritarian governments are leaders in the verb sense because they can just tell you what to do. And now all of a sudden, you know, communist countries are considered examples of leadership because they just tell people what to do. Really, I mean, I know this, this isn't going to sit well. I don't mean it to be this way. But in the military and in the fire department, under the direct order structure, that is authoritarian. I mean, that, it is what it is. Yeah. Yes, we live in a free country and we're we voluntarily chose to be in the fire service or in the military. But once you're in, you're allowing yourself to be managed uh, if it's a direct order system. So, so yes, no, the, the IC in that case, the Lieutenant, no matter if it was the fire chief who showed up uh, on the scene and started, you know, directing the scene, that's all management. None of that is actually leadership. Um, and we don't have to call it 
leadership. Uh, we could call it command. In fact, ICS, Incident Command System, calls it commanding. So we could call them an organizational commander or an incident commander. We don't call it the ILS, the Incident Leadership right, System. Right, right. But, but on the other hand, too, I think to give credit where credit is due, uh, an IC can, might be able to see more with what he, ha he or she has available um, at their buggy and from their position. And they might be able to say, hey, guys, can you try this over here? I, you know, uh, this might work to help us uh, attack this fire where it's seated right now. If, if we try this, can you guys give me a, a shot and try to do that? Because, yeah. you know, if they can, even if they take those few extra seconds on the radio to say, uh, you know, this is something I picked up from the chief over in, in Atlanta, and if this might work in our circumstance right now. Give it a try and report back to me within the next, you know, five minutes. Yeah, I would say, it, um, again, if you're in the middle of a call, really um, anything the IC or any, any officer is giving orders, they're not really giving okay. suggestions. So, but, but to take your example, if there was a training, a non-mandated training, let's say that the chief comes, the battalion chief or, you know, the fire chief comes, sits down at the station, uh, you guys are having coffee at the dinner table, and now nothing's mandated, but you're just talking about potential new strategies, then if a battalion chief or captain or lieutenant says, hey, I really like that strategy, I'm going to use that strategy, that would be leadership. But, uh, but to be fair, that, that really can't happen on the fire ground. Right. Uh, there isn't a time for debate or accepting or disagreeing. You, you have to dis you ha you have to agree with what your officer is saying, unless again, it's an obviously unsafe act and then it's right to push back for that. But, but otherwise th there's really no debate on the fire ground, I would, I would argue. So, but going back to the, uh, even just the daily routine and using the word organizational leader for a chief of a department, a lot of times that gets used as a noun, not as a verb. We're calling them the organizational leader because they're in charge, but, we can have a fire chief who comes in and doesn't do any changes at all. Just, just is the fire chief for four years, nothing in the department changes. Um, and by the definition of leadership that I proposed, uh, he w that wouldn't even qualify for change management if nothing changes. You're just sitting in a role that's in charge. And in fact, we have general orders that are orders that are already written down so that so that the person in charge doesn't have to repeat those orders every day, right? So it's plausible, obviously this doesn't really happen, but it's plausible or at least hypothetically possible that a fire chief can come in, really not give any orders for four years or a year or some time, and the department just runs itself because of the general orders that are already in place. And so that's sort of a proof here of what we're talking about that just because you're in charge of an organization doesn't mean you're leading them to anything new. It just means you are the leader in the sense of a noun, which can be exchanged for the manager or the administrator or the director or the commander. We just call it leader because leadership is sexy. My friend says it's the bacon for, for military and fire. You know, you put, you put leadership on anything and it's like wrapping it in bacon. And you know, it's funny. He's not Jewish of course, but you know, it's just, I, I know what he's talking about. It's like, yes, it, it is the bacon of everything. You call anything with leadership on it, it becomes sexier, right? So what we're trying to get to is, are you actually an organizational leader from our definition here that we propose and, and what does that look like? And so here's another thing before we move on, which is, okay, let's say you're in charge of an organization or a unit and you change something. You know, we talked about all the different steps that it, that it takes to be a leader. Change has to happen, but that's not the only thing. And in fact, you can change something and it can just be completely meaningless. Uh, we all know a fire chief that's come in and changed the uniforms just because one fire chief wanted collars and the other one wanted t-shirts or whatever. That's not meaningful change. That's just change because of preference. But you didn't really, you know, lead somebody's body, mind, or soul somewhere that they were already not. Um, same thing with like boots. You can change boots, you know, uh, 
between companies or gear between companies from one year to the next. That's not really meaningful change. That kind of change happens all the time, but that, that's, you know, that's somebody managing some sort of change. That's not leadership. So I just wanted to sort of front load those, those ideas before we get to really, okay, so what is organizational leadership? Well, going back to the definition of individual leadership, where we said you have to improve somebody's body, mind, or soul through, a, through reducing a gap of knowledge. It's got to be a positive change and, um, towards a goal, and they have to do it voluntarily, and it's got to last when you leave. Uh, that's how you know they have adopted it. Well, organizational leadership then is just doing that on a bigger scale. So if you're a, sh a shift officer, a company officer, you're trying to do that in your members on your shift. We talked about the TTM and, and how not everybody's going to be ready for that change at the same time. So you might only be able to get somebody to voluntarily take on a change, let's say one out of four members on your team or, or your shift at a time. But organizational leadership is doing that on a bigger scale so that now if you have a, sh a station officer, you're doing it with uh, three shift officers and your organizational leadership in action, your verb is basically a bigger version of that individual idea. So now you're teaching, hopefully if you're the station officer, you have something to teach to your shift officers. You're hopefully teaching them something that they now can improve upon and pass down to their firefighter. So now you've just taken leadership to the next level at that station level because you're passing on information, knowledge, and better ways to do something that hopefully trickles down to the firefighter. Same thing is true with a battalion. A battalion is now in charge of, let's say, five stations. And hopefully they're able to pass on, the battalion chief is passing on something to the station captains that then pass it down to the shift lieutenants that then pass it down to the firefighters. And you can bring that all the way up to the chief of a department. But that can only happen, Steve, if at each one of those levels, there is a, a, a knowledge or an ability to do something better than the level below you. Um, and it's possible, and we see this happening, I've seen it in my own department, um, and I've, I've heard about it in other departments, where somebody gets promoted and they don't really have anything to pass on. And at that point, all you can really do is manage. All you can do is tell somebody to do something. You're not actually providing them a better way of, of living or, or uh, treating the people under you. You're not actually passing something new down. And so from that standpoint, organizational leadership is really a question of leadership that goes beyond the individual or group level. You're now making some sort of change that's voluntarily accepted and it's spanning either a portion or all of your department. And um, that, again, would have to be without forcing people to do that. If you're doing mandatory training, that, that's management. But if you're saying, hey, folks, I'm going to set up a training. You're welcome to come. You don't have to. And it's going to be this Saturday, and we're going to go out to the parking lot, and, and I'm going to show you some, some new ways to do something. And if you get 50 people from your department to show up, that's leadership. And if that knowledge now trickles down to other people in the department and everybody begins doing this new thing you just mentioned, that's organizational leadership. And the beautiful thing about that is you don't have to be in charge. You don't have to be an officer to do that. And that's really where I think organizational leadership becomes this interesting topic because somebody can come in as a new recruit. And in fact, we have um, a number of recruits in Howard County that, you know, we had a guy who came in with, he was already a professional engineer. We have guys who come in there, they got their MBAs. We, got, we had a guy that just graduated recruit academy. He's got his um, juris doctorate. He's a, he's a lawyer, his JD. They probably have some things that they can pass on to other people that will increase their knowledge and maybe increase their way of doing something better. It may not be exactly uh, tied to the fire department, but I bet they have some knowledge to pass on. And the hope here, because we're talking about the fire service industry, is that this organizational leadership, this knowledge that you're passing that should spread throughout the organization, hopefully would obviously apply to the fire service or EMS or police. Um, and in, in that context, then you're an organizational leader if you're passing on knowledge that's adopted um, and on a wider scale. And again, you can do that from any rank. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Look, look at our conferences and the people who are, in, you know, 
who are vetted to be instructors at these conferences. This is, they're not all officers. Some of them are still, you know, snot nose, belly crawling, nozzle jockeys, but they've right. special, they specialized in something and they've gone to other conferences, they've gone to classes, they've learned how to do it and they're able to teach it. They, you know, they submit their presentations to the, the examining board of that conference and they're accepted and they're, wel they're welcomed in and they teach something. Um, you know, I remember, you know, back in 2018, when I was invited back to the, F the Great Florida Fire School to do the videos and interviews and audios, um, uh, and then and I said, yes, I'd be honored to come back again. And then I got a call five months before the conference and said, from the educational coordinator, and he goes, Are you all ready to come back? And I said, yeah, he goes, okay, good, because I want you to teach this year. I said, excuse me? He says, I want you to teach this year. I said, I've been out of the fire service for over 30 years. What can I teach? You know, from my side, I only had eight years in before I got hurt. He says, you're passionate about stuff in the fire service. Find that thing you're passionate about and you can teach that. And it, he pushed me and mentored me and got me into creating my, my class, The Elephant in the Firehouse, when ego gets in the way of passion. And not only did he get me to teach it, that teaching opportunity got me, led me to me being certified as a instructor in the state of Florida, as long as it's not, I can teach a course that's not connected to promotional exams. I never planned on that, but listening to the three podcasts with you and just having spoken with them last night, I realized that he, he is a leader by doing that. He passed on right. that information to me. I'm a teacher. I've always been a teacher, but I've never been a teacher in the fire service. And he taught me, he says, you have something to offer to share with other firefighters because you're passionate about it. It doesn't mean that you're still in there. It just means that you can share that with other firefighters to help them. And so I, I did it for, you know, two years. And, um, I would have been back last year, but we had, of course, through the pandemic, we had to cancel the, the school. But the fact is that you can make that change and you don't have to be the biggest muckety muck because I was really civilian, <laughs> official civilian at, at, at that conference. Um, and yet it changed my attitude to, I, I'm not just a podcaster anymore. And he st still saw me as a firefighter, just was, because of a disability has been out for a long time, but still had something to offer and to teach. And that, Absolutely. Meant, that meant a great deal to me. And so, um, and, go ahead. Steve, you bring up two great points that I just want to uh, touch upon, which I think is a, a perfect segue here to the next um, issue, is you mentioned conferences and you mentioned teaching that's not tied to promotions. And so in conferences, you, you buy a ticket to the conference and you're allowed to go to whatever class you want to go to. That's right. all voluntary, right? Uh, so that's like brings you all the way up to the sort of the ledge of leadership, which is you've now learned something voluntarily from somebody else, right? Now the question is, do you take it home with you and, and do you adopt it once, you, you know, once you're out of the presence of that, that person who's telling you what they told you? That, that would be the true marker of whether or not that person is a leader that you listen to. But in, in conferences, that's a, a great example of leadership taking place, or at least potential leadership taking place, because you're choosing to voluntarily learn from somebody that you think can give you something that you maybe didn't know. Now, you mentioned teaching in, in a department or, uh, you know, in a sense that's not tied to promotions. And we know that uh, in a lot of departments, the way that you promote is you have to, you're mandated to take a certain amount of courses and they check them off and people call it, you know, checkbox courses. And in fact, there's a lot of jokes about fire department learning because you go, you sit in this course, the instructor teaches you the test, you know, the day of the test or the morning of the test, they review the questions. They say, hey, if you come across this question, uh, you know, this might be the answer that you might want to choose. You know, it's just a whole running joke, but you're forced to do that if you want to promote. But, um, but to your point, teaching a course in a department that's completely voluntary and has nothing to do with promotion 
fits that definition of a leader, uh, or at least, again, potential leader, if people choose to adopt what it is you're saying and, and take that into their lives. And so by taking those two ideas, I think really in order to do organizational leadership on a department level uh, within your organization, it's really about creating some sort of system that allows people to voluntarily learn and it's not tied, it's not, it's not connected to any mandatory thing. You're not forced to go to the class and you don't have to go to the class to promote. And it's almost like building in a conference system within your department. You just give people the chance to learn something new and you know, adopt it into their lifestyle. And I think, I think that's really the epitome of organizational leadership within you know, a department, a fire department, or any organization for that matter, um, which again, brings us to this idea of systems. You know, the human body has all these systems, Steve. We have the central nervous system, the respiratory system, circulatory system, the immune system, right? There's a bunch of them. Uh, there's way more than that. And in the organization, we have organizational systems as well. Um, the difference is that in the human body, those systems are, are sort of created and developed and maintained automatically. You know, we don't have to do anything to maintain or develop those systems. In an organization, systems are not created and maintained automatically. Somebody has to build them, and then somebody or some people have to maintain the system. And so that is one, I think, aspect of an organizational leader, which is you either have to know how to create a system, and in this case, a system that enhances voluntary learning, or you have to know how to leverage them or use them if they're already in place. Right. And so I think that is sort of an aspect of organizational leadership, which is a little bit different than if you're just leading an individual. So that, now the question is, how do you leverage or create a system that lets people learn on a wide scale that's completely voluntary without forcing the replication of that teaching? And, uh, and actually, that, that can segue us, if you want to, into health and wellness systems, which there's a lot of national guidance on. And a, a lot of the similar theme between the, between the many different organizations talk about non-punitive learning. You know, uh, health and wellness systems that are, that are non-punitive and are just there to help you if you seek it out. Um, and I think that, that is a, uh, a great example if we want to talk more about organizational systems and actually use an example, we could talk about the health and wellness systems that could be created in an organization to help people uh, increase their you know, knowledge on um, physical fitness or, uh, you know, psychological and mental health, um, or even with chaplain services, you know, your soul, if, if, uh, if that's something that the department wants to seek out. So, um, so I think that's a, one, one example we could take this year if you want to. Is that a um, leading segue to part four of our podcast? <laughs> because I'm sure, uh, if that's where it goes, it goes there. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure health and wellness, we could be covered we could actually, there's an, enough in there to, to cover, do another episode with. Because, that might be, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, depending on your time scale, you know, we have things changing in the family. So uh, I have to uh, yeah. be really willing to manage that. It doesn't have to be right away. But I just think that um, because we started, I think, I think it would be a great way to, to finish the series only because we started at that overall health and wellness, wellness, not only for the organization, but for the people in the organization first. Because if we don't have a healthy organization, people, we don't have a healthy organization to even talk about. So I think that'd be right. a great way to, to create, uh, as you and I might say, the CUM, the, 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 the big summary of from where we started to, to, to bringing it in. Because I, I don't, I think if we just give it like, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, we're, it's a short shrifting to our audience. Um, who have been listening to these three, and again, it can even stand alone as its as its own podcast, talking about yeah. health and wellness systems in 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 organiz, organizational leadership as part of it. So I think that would be a great thing to, for us to add on when the next time you're available. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, um, I would just uh, add on to then what we were talking about a minute ago. Um, you know, earlier we had mentioned ICS. We mentioned incident command systems. Right. Um, that, that's an example of an organizational system that, um, that basically allows a firefighter or somebody who's fluent in that model to essentially create an organization right on a scene. 
to manage that scene, right? That's the idea of ICS. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities between ICS and a and a existing organization. The IC, the incident commander, is kind of like a chief. You know, you got the um, uh, the executive staff and, and uh, command staff. You have like a, a PIO, a public information officer, liaison officer, safety officer, but then you have the flop, right? Finance, logistics, operations, planning. That's the model for any business structure. Uh, and ICS gives you that. And so um, using that idea um, of ICS and how you can sort of create um, scene management right on the scene of an incident, an organizational leader, ideally a fire chief, if, they're really, if they really know their stuff, a fire chief should be able to go to, you know, uh, small town USA and essentially create a fire department from scratch, right? Uh, if they don't know how to do that, then really um, they're not, they're probably not a manager or a leader, but especially if it's going to be a volunteer firehouse, um, it would have to be voluntary based systems that they're putting in place and creating. And so um, that's what I think an organizational leader would look like from the position of a fire chief. But again, we said, you know, anybody who knows how to manage or leverage or create systems could create a system of learning within their organization um, that spreads throughout the organization um, and, and elevates the entire organization uh, on some new level, whether it's their body, physically, their mind about learning about something or even their soul. You know, nowadays we have a, we just had a, a guy in my department graduate from divinity school and he's chomping at the bit to, to be, uh, you know, lined up with our chaplain in our department and, uh, and start learning and, and start, um, you know, getting out to the field and, and helping folks that are maybe having some spiritual battles. And so I think that's, that's, that's really cool. That really is. And, and I gotta say, I think listeners and our viewers, you'll know if you're in a department now, you'll know whether your chief is a manager or a leader. I can tell you from what you've taught me over these three episodes that in my first department, I was very lucky to have a chief who was a leader. He was hands-on all the time, taught us new things. He, he didn't just give it to the lieutenant or the captain to do or the volunteer lieutenants. He was off, he'd come out in, outside with us or sit in, in the break room and sit around the table with us and say, let's talk about this scenario. What would we do? And okay, what, what would you think you would do next? And what are you gonna do if this happens there? Okay, now let's think of a better, is there a better way we could have handled that like that? Um, late in my time there, I set up a video system for them. So we were able to use video for both training and after action learning. Um, and he was very, op very open to that and he liked the idea. And yet in my second department, the chief, the, the chief officers and all the line officers were elected. And as you said, you can have many people be officers, but that does not make them leaders. Um, most of those officers were elected based on popularity. Um, and mostly pop popularity, let's say. Um, and some of them were good managers, but I wouldn't say that, except for one of the, the Monday through Friday, nine to five paid, paid guys, a really nice captain we had, who was a really good leader. He was a guy who would teach volunteers when they came in. He was happy to sit down with us and discuss stuff if he wasn't tied up with anything. Um, I think he was the only one. Everybody else was a manager. And only because now what I've learned from you. So I think I was blessed that in that first department where I came in with no background at all, not knowing anything about the fire service, other than big, big red shiny trucks, um, I had a leader who was also the chief. And I, uh, we found a mentor from one of the regular guys, paid guys. And we didn't find him. 
he gravitated to us because my buddy and I spent as much time as we did at the firehouse, always coming there to learn. We were always willing to learn. And he was that teacher for us. And I think that that's very important. I think, so if you're listening today or watching this today and you're a member of a department, again, fire, law enforcement, or EMS, you know who above you is a manager and they might be a damn good manager. I'm not going to take away I've been a manager, so I mean, you know, and I've been a good manager, I've been a bad manager in certain things. I, I'm not going to say that I'm the very best manager that ever existed, but you're going to know if they're a manager or a leader based on listening to these, these, these podcasts with you, because you've really opened up a whole new vision for somebody like me, who's been out for, out for nearly 40 years, but can still remember those people who affected me, especially in the positive ways, and accepted me, a nobody who didn't know Jack about the fire service, and trained me to be a decent firefighter and allowed me to go on with other training. So I became an engineer and I became a high level rescue tech. To me, that, and that was all in those first four years. That's why I think that that chief was a good leader as well. Because I didn't know why. Yeah. He would pick a, a rookie like me and my buddy to go to that first state conference um, when there were so many people who had been out longer than us. And I didn't know that for all three years that we were sent. And I just couldn't go the fourth year because we moved out of the state. But when I got to see him several years ago and we were sitting down reminiscing and he said, I bet you wonder why I sent you and Richard to that, those fires, that fire school. And we said, oh, yeah, we talk about that almost every time we talk. And he says, only because I saw leadership in you two boys. He says, you were professional in your field. You were professional when you came to learn from, from us as a, as a rookie. And I knew that you boys were going to be officers in this department because I saw that in you. And you guys were like hungry. You were like were, were famished. You always wanted more knowledge. You wanted to learn more. That's why I chose the two of you over anybody else who remembers. And I just sat there stunned. We didn't know that. We had no idea. But again, with what you've just taught us, I look back at that time sitting in his living room a couple of years ago. And now I know I was right. He was a great leader to me and I think to that department in the time that I was there. I don't know before I was there and I can't speak for after I was there. But I know that while I was there, in my four years, he was a great leader based on your definitions. Yeah, and you, and you bring up a great point, Steve, which is, um, which is that and, and we use the term voluntary uh, throughout these three the, uh, podcasts, these series. And um, I certainly don't want to make it seem as though volunteer departments are all leadership and career departments are all management because mm -hmm somehow it's called the volunteer department. You bring up a great point. You can be in a volunteer department and the person can just be managing based on the rules that they're giving to people or the orders that they're giving to people. Um, and you can be in a career department where the system has a very orderly system and a rule-based system, but you can have people who emerge or come out as leaders that are just offering, freely offering a new way to do something and they're not forcing anybody to do it. And so I definitely want to make that point very clear. Volunteer fire departments are not necessarily leadership and career departments are management. I'm not saying that you can have management or leadership in both. The telltale sign in my, in my opinion is managing is done by rules or by force or by incentive or disincentive based systems. Whereas leadership is just uh, completely allowing the person to make a free choice as to whether or not they want to listen to you in the first place and adopt what you're giving. Uh, secondly, um, and so that, that's a, a good distinction that you sort of uh, teased out there that I wanted to bring up. And I think I also uh, want to mention that I'm not trying to demonize management. I, that, I got my master's degree uh, in management science from, uh, from Hopkins. And so I, I really appreciate management. I think it's a foundational aspect for leadership. I think, I think any good leader knows how to manage. Right. And I, th I don't necessarily think every good manager knows how to lead. I think that's the distinction here. 
is that a good leader knows when to make things voluntary or mandatory. A manager only knows mandatory and rule-based systems. But we need rule-based systems. And I would offer that a firefighter wants to be with the best fire ground manager, whether it's an officer or an incident commander, they want to be with somebody who knows exactly what to do and makes the right choices and right decisions all the time. That's who you want to be with. And that has, in my opinion, nothing to do with leadership. It just has to do with fire grant and emergency management. So management's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just that there is a difference between allowing somebody to learn voluntarily and adopt things voluntarily and forcing somebody to do things because either they're your child, right? <laughs> and you need to force them to do something or you work for an organization. And so you have to do certain things because the organization is held accountable. That's very different. So, but management's not bad and leadership is good. It's just two different things. And uh, I, I think it's okay to prefer wanting a leader over a manager because it means that's just saying you prefer voluntary choice over not voluntary choice. There's nothing wrong with that but you definitely need both. And, and you can't always leave because there's going to be a time where people aren't ready to listen to you and they still have to do what you're asking them to do, especially if you're working in an organization. Right. So. Plus the fact that our three areas of public safety, we are also somewhat paramilitary. We have to acknowledge that fact. Right. So being that even a volunteer department is still paramilitary to some level. Right. Um, you have to have the grunts. You have to have the first level of, managers or leaders, the second level, all the way up to the chief. But the fact is that there's still techniques and methodology that can be used to be a leader in many ways, rather than just a manager. A manager can be right. both. A manager can learn right. to, be, to, to be both through experience and extra learning and things like that. And, and prove him or herself to be more than a manager and by being a leader. Um, right. And some leaders who were or could be good leaders get stuck in the, the brain thought of management. And they don't give themsel themselves the, the foresight to say, wait a second, I can do more than just manage this department with the, the budget and the, the, I got to talk with the city council. The, that's just management. But I need to lead this crew. I need them to see me for with my experience that got me to the place of being a chief and how and what I, what I can share with them to help them grow. And I think right. that, that's that we have to say that nobody is, is shut out from either one. It's the choice that you make Right. In that in the position to say, am I going to be a manager or am I going to be a leader? Yep, absolutely. And I, I would just close uh, by saying this, um, Steve, I would, I would go back to Aristotle. I, uh, I'm obviously a follower of his, his teaching. He's a, he's a leader to me, even though he lived uh, 2,500 years ago. You know, going back to what he said, uh, and, and by the way, Aristotle wasn't a fatalist. He, he definitely believed that people can change. He didn't believe that you were born a certain way and that that's the way you were going to be. That's why he talks about responsibility and he talks about becoming more virtuous. He thinks people can change. And, and I go back to what he said. He says, uh, we are what we repeatedly do. You know, we become our habits. Our health is from our wellness. And uh, I would just add to that, especially in the context of leadership and, and why we do what we do, um, which is, I'm paraphrasing uh, a guy, Albert Bandura, who was a social psychologist. I say that, yes, we are what we repeatedly do, and we thank Aristotle for that, um, but we do what we repeatedly see and hear. And if we think we're a leader, or if we're looking out for leaders, uh, we want to know what is it that we're seeing and hearing that would make us better ourselves or make somebody else better. Um, and, and that's, that leads us to uh, doing what we repeatedly do is, is seeing and hearing things that, that guide us. So, um, so I, would, I would close with that, is that we do what we repeatedly see and hear. And if you think you're a leader, then you should be doing things and saying things to those that are under you uh, 
things that would make them better in their body, their mind, or their soul. That's great. I, I think, I think you've, I can't say we finished because you got the great wrap up coming up in this next one, which I, which I think is going to be um, excellent. And I think you've given our listeners and our viewers a new way of thinking about leadership in, in especially in the fire service. Um, and the overall, how you defined health and wellness for them. And I think that uh, hopefully that um, some of the, the big names in the fire service who um, are the authors of many articles in our trades and stuff like that and really go out, in their, out of their way to help firefighters get healthier and which will then give them better wellness. Um, I hope they're listening to this as well and hear this for their approach because they do care so much about firefighter health and wellness. I hope uh, the, the people at the IAFC SHS division think about this, th these terms and how they apply to uh, safety, health and survival in the fire service because we're so busy now and concentrated on our uh, health initiatives, fitness for duty, our behavioral health initiatives, which we'll be talking a little bit about, I guess, in, the, in that next, next podcast. But you've just given us a menu, basically, of a, w a new way of looking at who we are and the job that we do, how we do it, but knowing that it all starts inside of us first. And then it grows from there by our understanding who we are and what we have to do and what, what we have to do for ourselves, what we want to do for our community and how we go about doing that. And then the people who we seek out to help us fulfill that self mission that we've created. And I, I think there couldn't be anything more valuable in the general sense of what we're talking about in, in today's emergency services than what you've taught us in these three episodes. I appreciate that, Steve. Actually, what you just said reminds me of a, uh, another famous quote of another leader that I am a follower of, which is uh, the sage Hillel. And he says, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? Exactly. And if not now, when? And what he means by that is, uh, of course, you know this, Steve, but for your listeners, that we have to be responsible for ourselves first. We have to grow our body, mind, our soul. Yes, we might need to seek somebody else out to teach us how to do that, but we need to make sure we're doing that for ourselves. But if we stop there, what Hillel says is we become a what? Because animals don't really care about others around them, but humans, we can care about others. We shouldn't just care about ourselves. We should go to the other person and and start helping out the next person. And that truly is, I think, the first step of leadership is trying to see what you can do voluntarily to help somebody else. And so, uh, so it's a quote that I love and what you said just uh, reminded me of that. So. You're great. I'm glad that that, that, that means a lot. Um, we don't get to put something like that into a podcast all that, all that often. Um, gee, I, I just can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm thrilled that we're going to have, a, 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 have you come back because at the end of this, when we were off, off air, I was going to remind you that you always have an open invitation to come back anytime. Um, but I'm glad we kind of set, set, set one up, uh, at least in the idea version of it. And uh, it's, again, it's just been a wonderful class that you've shared with us, basically. This, this has been like going to a conference and listening to a great teacher who has lots of experience in, in many facets, not just of being a firefighter, it's being a, uh, a, a well-learned individual who wants to come and share and teach the deeper part about being a firefighter. We're just not hose draggers, you know? We're not just hose draggers. We're not just carry a badger and a gun, or we're not just, you know, carry a life pack box and a med kit. We're more than that uh, because we're special people. We dedicate ourselves, whether we're career or volunteer, or part pay, whatever. we dedicate ourselves to help others. And yes, there are others in the community do that. People join the Red Cross and they, and they help with the food banks, something like that. But all of us are special because that we want to reach out to others. But public safety, we know that we're reaching out, 
But we also know there's a very sharp edge in what we do. And right. none of us want to think about it, but we know it's there because if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing this job. Because sometimes that's, right. for some it's the attraction. I want to get into that first work in house fire. Okay. Yeah. But once, you know, like I told that story before is that there was one person who was on an engine with me who once we got there, didn't want to get into that work in house fire. Okay, so right. I, got, I was lucky that somebody came in behind me to back me up. But the fact is, you can't judge an old phrase, you can't judge the book by its cover. The, we have, you just can't say a firefighter is good uh, or a police officer is better than a fire because he carries a gun. There is no measurement. It's what we do out of our love and dedication to our communities that defines who we are. And mm -hmm. what you've taught us in these three episodes teaches us how to be better people first, better individuals, not just in our departments, but in our own lives and with our families, whether we're, we're still with our parents or siblings, or we have our own families with spouses and, and kids. You're teaching us basically looking inward first at yourself, who you are and who you want to be. And then you have to make yourself fit into the package. You can't make the package fit you. If you're going to be a firefighter, you want to be a police or go to the police academy, you want to be a paramedic. None of those three choices are easy courses. Easy. No matter, again, career volunteer makes no difference. There are still things you have to learn. And if you're not willing to judge yourself and say, I'm open to learning new things, learning about new people, how to deal with people, because sometimes we do, we don't just put out fires and, and, and rescue babies. We have to deal with people one-on-one -on -one, and we have to know how to do it. But some of us have never had that, that level of need before to have to help somebody in their worst situation. We have to know how to talk right. to them, how to deal with them. And most of us need somebody to teach us how to do that. It, we're not born with that. That's not innate in any of us. Right. Um, so I think you've given us a new way of looking introspectively to ourselves and then applying, once we've done that examination, how do I make myself a better firefighter, a better law enforcement officer, a better EMT or paramedic so I can serve my department and my community even better than I'm doing today? Yeah. And that's, I think, what sums it up. So I can't- Thank you very much, enough. Steve. This is, it's been a pleasure. Uh, first, it's been a pleasure just getting to know you, um, and um, and we we share a lot of of information and, and background together, which is is nice on on, on many levels. And um, I wish you all the best in the near future, especially. And uh, when you. whenever you're ready, just let me know, and we'll set you up to come back for the uh, for the return engagement. Uh, I think it'll be a great summary for what these three classes were. It's a great way to. Boom. Right. So let's jump in now. It's like, I guess, going from the classroom to the practical, you there know, you at a conference. You know, you can, you can take three days of classes, but you want to climb those ladders and you want to pull those ropes. And then finally, on the fourth right. day of the conference, you're outside and you're doing, doing the knocks and stuff like that. So I think that's the way it works. Gee, thanks so much. Uh, I wish you all the best. And um, I, I'm happy to call you a friend. I really am. Um, Likewise, Steve. Thank you very much. And I appreciate all the effort and everything you, you're doing. Um, we are going to put um, links uh, as soon as they're up uh, in our, on our podcast page for Dr. G uh, on our website. And um, uh, for those of you who are interested in once it's fully published in public, the, the reading his full dissertation and see how well it applies um, to what we've been talking about. And then when uh, we'll be able to let the, also when the National uh, Fallen Firefighters Foundation releases their book, of which he is a contributor, um, we'll make sure that we uh, put that on our website as well so that you can go through the, through the NFFF to uh, get, get that book. Because I can tell you that from what I've been told about it, um, it's going to be very meaningful for all of us. Um, not just if we've suffered a loss, but 
those of us who fight every day and hear about other losses, I think it's going to be uh, very informative for all of us and educational for all of us. So we'll keep you posted on that. Again, uh, Gamali Bear, thank you so much for joining us and uh, teaching us and sharing with us. And we look forward to you coming back very soon. Thank you, Steve. Talk to you soon. All right, folks, if you're watching the video, that will be the end. If you're listening to the audio, we'll be right back right after these words. As always, please stay tuned.